Welcome to Christian Answers Live, an outreach of Christian Answers Incorporated, a nationwide apologetics ministry dedicated to defending those essential truths found in the Bible, dedicated to giving Christian answers. Protestantism was not born out of a protest against papal power, a corrupt clergy, uh, changing social roles, or a concern over moral and institutional abuses. These all came into the debate, but there were loyal defenders of the Church of Rome who nevertheless, nevertheless pointed these out and called for reform. No, the one issue between the reformers and Rome was this. How can a sinner be accepted by a holy God? This was, as Yale historian Roland Bainton has argued, the only issue of the Reformation, out of which every other discussion flowed. In short, the Reformers really believed that they were standing on the side of the Apostle Paul against a corrupt church that had corrupted the gospel. It was nothing short of a recovery of apostolic Christianity. But what is this doctrine by which the church stands or falls? Well, it centers on that one word, righteousness. At first, whenever Luther, an Augustinian monk, came across that word, he understood it like any other monk of his day. Righteousness was a moral quality one possessed. It was both something God poured into you and something you did because of that infusion. But either way, it was something you possessed, something you actually attained. But Luther knew his own soul and his own Bible too well. He knew that the righteousness which God demands is not the best a person can do, but the highest perfection. And yet, he also knew that every person has sinned and fallen short of that highest perfection. So that word righteousness became a word of condemnation, a horrifying, guilt-producing word that served only to remind the sinner that he stood under the judgment of a holy God for failing to live up to God's righteous standards who wouldn't want God to be Mr. Nice Guy and let bygones be bygones. But Luther knew that for that rosy notion, he'd find no support in the Christian scriptures. And just when Luther was at the height of despair, he ran across that line in Romans, which Paul picks up from the prophet Habakkuk. For in the gospel, the apostle writes, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Suddenly the lights came on. In the law, the righteousness of God is revealed. That is, we learn in the law the moral character of God, a moral character by which the whole universe, ourselves included, is measured. In the law, we find no pardon, no leniency, no let bygones be bygones. As God's character can't change, so his law can't be molded like a wax nose to accommodate our failures. But what Paul is saying here, and what Luther clearly saw Paul saying here, is that there's another kind of righteousness. In the gospel, we discover not merely the righteousness of God, that is his, his moral standards, which only condemn us for not living up to them, but this time, the righteousness from God. That is what Paul later calls the gift of righteousness. Throughout Paul's epistle to the Romans, he argues that the person who stands before the law, judged and thoroughly condemned, is in the perfect position for the first time to understand the gospel. That's because the gospel doesn't command us to attain a certain level of righteousness, but rather it gives to us in one instant the gift of perfect standing before God. See, the biblical imagery is rich in explaining this great truth. In Romans, it's spoken of as a righteousness that is imputed. That is, just as Adam's guilt was imputed or credited to the whole human race, so too the perfect holiness and righteousness of Christ is imputed or credited to every believer through faith alone because of Christ alone. But in every age, human nature recoils at the thought from Adam and Eve sewing fig leaves together to cover up their shame in the Garden of Eden to you and me trying to cover it up with pop psychology and self-esteem mythology, we've been collectively engaged in an enterprise of self-deception. We like to think that we have standards that we're living up to, but the issue isn't whether you're living up to your own standards, which, by the way, just a point of information, you are not, if you really think about your life honestly. The real issue is whether you have perfectly conformed in heart, thought, mind, attitude, and action 
to God's righteousness, loving him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Somehow you have to show up before God possessing perfect righteousness. The church today, yes, even the so-called Bible-believing, conservative, evangelical churches are as confused on this question today as the medieval church faced by the reformers and the Galatian church faced by Paul. We are certain that a confrontation is about to take place and is already taking place between the one true gospel and the competing gospels. If you've heard more sermons and broadcasts and read more Christian books lately on following tips and principles for the victorious Christian life, you'll understand Paul's sharp criticism of salvation by technique or spiritual program. It's just that he calls it the curse of the law, and we might call it today the curse of principles and steps. So we still face, human beings have had to face time immemorial. How can I, a sinful person, be reconciled to a holy God? That's the heart of Paul's concern about the Galatian church, a church that had confused the gospel of an imputed righteousness that is a free gift with a false gospel of an inherent or infused righteousness that was the Christian's own holiness that made him or her acceptable to God. No minor trifle, this. The only gospel that can present you before God's judgment covered in the righteousness he requires. In related matters, there's several, uh, there's several points at which the gospel is being attacked, and we're going to try to touch on those today. We have Michael Orton on for at least an hour. Then we also have a, a list, if anybody is interested in some of the previous shows that we've done. We've put together a list of uh, all the different radio programs that we've done with our guests. And yeah, some very um, some very good shows in the past. Of course, again, Ray Comfort was a very popular show. We also have uh, we had on Charlie Clough talking about uh, talking about the age of the Earth. We've had uh, Dr. Michael Gerard on creation science and the impossibility of evolution. Mm -hmm. Had Tommy Ice in studio talking about spiritual warfare. We also had a, an exciting show. The second hour, uh, we had in studio. Um, uh, pastor Jackson Boyette, mm -hmm. who is our pastor, and a special guest, Dave Sitton. Now, exclusively from Christian Answers, a review of Dr. Walter Martin's book, The Roman Catholic Church in History. Jim Tungate, co-host of Christian Answers Live and director of research and publications for Christian Answers, documents Martin's position on Romanism in this eye-opening seven-page book review. Now, as Christians, what ought our attitude to be? It ought to be an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of joy, because God has delivered us from this system into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. We are not the descendants of this papacy, nor do we wish to be. We do not wish its sacraments. We do not wish its dogmas. We worship only Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords redeemer and savior of lost men. We reject a corrupt church, a backslidden church, an apostate church, and reach out to her people with the love of Christ. Other topics covered in this book review are, was Peter the first pope, Catholic tradition in the Bible, the Roman Catholic doctrine of Mary, confession, the mass, and purgatory. We're talking tonight about uh, this doctrine of justification. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. To see the full length video, please select by tapping on the first screen to the right. To see the entire playlist where this particular video is found, select by tapping on a touch screen on a cell phone or by clicking on a regular computer. The second screen to the right.